it became very political and the Bar Association was captured at this time, and I can't give you names because I don't remember, by a, a liberal bloc. So what you're doing is not getting a qualified or not qualified. You're getting a, we don't like the way you think, vote. So they were taken out of play by Mitchell. And there was a fair amount of conversation, and I've read some of the tapes, and they're interesting, to watch this process of evolving to a different candidate. Now, uh, 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 at this moment in history, early November 2011, I've had any number of friends observe to me that they're the ones who first recommended Bill Rehnquist. The fact is I've heard a conversation between Mitchell and Nixon where he just became, he became the candidate. And within three minutes he was named the candidate just before he was announced. Lewis Powell was simple. Bill Rehnquist was a 47-year-old, very bright, lawyer from Phoenix, Arizona. He loved his family. And he was the kind of guy that I figured, I knew him reasonably well in the Justice Department, he'd be perfectly happy uh, retiring to his apple orchard in uh, uh, Colorado with his family. And he had no pretension at all. Very low-key, but he was brilliant. Legally brilliant. He was politically not quite as uh, capable. He didn't think that way. Uh, 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 and Lewis Powell was probably 15, 16, 17 years older, old, years older so he must have been in his mid early 60s. Um, he was getting up there. Wasn't that, th that was one of the, uh, the disadvantages of Powell after these other nominees or these other considerations had fallen through. And finally, the president felt that he had to make a mm -hmm. had to announce it, make a decision and announce it fairly shortly. Powell was clearly distinguished, but he didn't pass the age criterion that Nixon had, where he wanted someone who was much yes. younger. Powell was 66, I think, at the time, well, 64 he, maybe. In that era. And and they were there were concerns about his health. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, he, he fooled everybody yeah. and happily and lived for yeah. 15 years on the court. But there was a, uh, didn't uh, Senator Eastland uh, yes. tell him that, yes. uh, bring him up a bit short? Well, uh, he did, but Eastland had a way with words. <laughs> he was a man of few words. I mean, Eastland was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he was like the spider in the center of the web. And I give him almost full credit for ensuring that these nominations were successfully processed. We're in this atmosphere where Carswell and Hainsworth had been knocked down where there was this battle over Haines or Fortis. Uh, and two law professors, uh, one named Black and one named Cox from Yale and Harvard, uh, were speaking to the philosophically left senators and saying, the president doesn't really have the full ability to put people on the Supreme Court. You have an obligation here. And you can look at their philosophy. You can pretty well look at anything you want. So it's that moment in history where we're watching the Senate uh, strut its stuff over advice and consent. And they really did, the liberal left did not want Bill Rehnquist. Why? Because he was 47 and he was brilliant. First in his class at Stanford. Brilliant. Uh, 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 and had this in candy uh, legal skill and uh, uh, that ser served our country well during his entire 34 or five years on the court. Uh, uh, but he also was an extremely gregarious and uh, uh, likable guy and cared about people. I knew him well, but when he was named by the president, no one knew him. He was a lawyer, he was a, a sub-cabinet officer at the Justice Department, Office of the Legal Counsel, basically writes legal opinions for the White House. They, uh, uh, it's where the lawyers, lawyers are. Uh, and that's what he did. He, he fit a number of criteria, but not, uh, not the sartorial no. criteria. Nobody told that story today. Will you tell it? Well, I'll tell it in the sense that uh, uh, Bill always wore hush puppies, and he had a bad back, 
and he sat in a reclining chair. And I can picture 41 years later seeing him in that reclining chair all the time. And he just was in incredible pain. But he had no sense of style. And I hesitate to say that. I would if he were still alive, because he thought he did. Uh, and uh, the day he was uh, nominated, he was, before he went on the cameras, he was wearing a, red, a pink shirt with a red tie. Now, even in 1971, we didn't wear pink shirts with red ties. <laughs> he did. Uh, and things didn't get any better <laughs> in terms of his uh, uh, attire. But uh, people tended to look past that because he was uh, both competent, uh, capable, and uh, personally attractive. The evening, for example, we worked awfully hard to get him confirmed. Uh, he worked awfully hard to become confirmed. Uh, and there was a team, of course, of people, mostly in the Justice Department, that uh, uh, would respond to uh, requests for information from senators. And I mean, it was, it was like a trial, only there was a different order. Uh, the evening he was confirmed, we were ecstatic and elated and had a party. He went to his son's basketball game. In other words, he, he had this incredible way of keeping things in perspective. Uh, uh, now, the uh, president called him the same day. Uh, I've heard the tape. Uh, and the uh, president was just ecstatic and talked to him about the fact that 26 people voted against uh, Chief Justice uh, Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes, yeah. Uh, and Bill didn't know this. Bill knows everything. He knew everything. I mean, he was a Supreme Court junkie. It was his whole life. Uh, and uh, when I heard that tape, be this conversation between the two and the president's talking about, don't let, don't let the social scene, don't let the social scene change the way you act. <laughs> Fat chance. I mean, Bill Rehnquist was not affected by the social scene. He liked to play poker with his buddies, uh, and he smoked. But basically, the social attitude of anybody wouldn't affect him a twit. We would, um, he remained my good friend, uh, even though I don't practice Supreme Court law. He remained my good friend during that entire 34 year period. And right after he was confirmed, uh, he was the ninth justice on the court. He didn't have a black limousine like he did when he was chief. He had a little, very small car with a very big marshal. And he'd come and pick me up and we'd go have lunch. And we could barely cram in this car with his driver marshal. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, he was always uh, uh, extremely open, and even during that period of time, as he was becoming the Chief Justice, uh, we would meet and talk, we'd talk about family. We wouldn't talk about the Supreme Court or constitutional law or politics. We'd talk about uh, the life we lived together. Uh, and that speaks to him as a person. Now, going back to that uh, moment when he was confirmed on December 10th um, in the Senate, uh, vote was 68-26. We held, contrary to what happened with Carswell and Hainsworth, we were able to hold the coalition of moderate Republicans and Southern Democrats together. It wasn't split around Democrat-Republican. If it had been, we'd lose because the Democrats controlled the Senate. But there was a split that basically fit around Nixon's attitude toward law and order. And we were able to look to, it's pretty hard to, to not support your president, unless you have a real good reason or don't want to be reelected. <laughs> so we were able to hold those Republicans together, even though some, for some of them the glue was not very thick. They really would rather have gone with the Kennedy by uh, uh, Phil Hart, uh, John Tunney group. 
who tried very hard to marshal support against Rehnquist. They couldn't break the two apart, even though there were the, the liberal Democrats who tried to separate the two because there were questions about Bill and the conservative prominent bar association types supporting Lewis Powell who just wanted to get Powell through there. Then was then, now is now. This is interesting, but it's ancient history. What difference does this make to us today? What difference did, did uh, President Nixon's appointment of, uh, appointments of Justice Powell and Justice and Chief Justice Rehnquist mean to us? I can uh, give you a good example because I live out in Wyoming and I teach, uh, I taught last year a course on criminal justice. And if you look at the way the law is today, it's because of Nixon's appointment of those four people, but I also think it's because of the appointment of Bill Rehnquist. Rehnquist's philosophy was such that he, well, I'll start that a different way, Nobody realizes that in the Justice Department there was an Attorney General's Committee on Law Enforcement. Rehnquist was on it, I was on it, and there were two or three other people on it. What we did was think about how to balance the record because Ramsey Clark and Earl Warren had a sociological approach to the prosecution of law. Nixon and Mitchell had a different philosophy. And because of the legislative actions that were initiated with Bill Rehnquist through the Department of Justice when he was in the Office of Legal Counsel, and then the way he approached cases and built a coalition from being a sole dissenter when he was young to building a 5-4 majority as he matured changed the world in which we live today. It didn't happen overnight, but it happened because Powell and Rehnquist were coupled together by President Nixon, and it ratifies the statement I read in Nixon's book, the Supreme Court, the four Supreme Court nominations are the most important thing I did, one of the most important things I did as president. It ratifies it.